What's going on, everyone? And welcome to another episode of Writing Friction. And as always, today's guest is pretty cool. Everyone say hello to Todd Goldberg. How are you, Todd? You know, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I spent uh, the morning today watching American Civics <laughs> at work. That felt pretty great. Uh -huh. um, and then I went to Target, where I feared for my life. And then I came back and uh i took a lactate pill yeah okay all right it's my screen all for this <laughs> and now here i am talking to you I, mean, I, I don't know yeah i mean there's a lot of things to be scared for your in your life going into target these days exactly <laughs> well true. you know here, here's the thing man like it used to be i'd go to target or anywhere i'd leave my house right and i wouldn't have to ponder my mortal coil to go and get a taco yeah. and now every time i leave the house i'm like well do I want to be dead in two weeks? It's crazy, man. I know. I mean, you know, the podcast, I started this podcast a couple of months ago and it's just, it's grown so much so quickly and it's amazing what's been going on with people. You know, it's, it's the zoom thing. I see everyone's bookcases. Everyone has a thing behind them. I'm actually trying to pick out what's behind you, but I can't, it's a little too blurry. Anything worth mentioning? Well, let's see here on the wall. We've got, yeah. uh, we've got about a third of my published books yeah. up here on the wall. So my new book, which is coming out shortly, is my 15th book. I mean, so yeah, you've really got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've got about 50% of my published books. Awesome. Yeah. Frames. Yeah. Over here, we've got um, we've got books. Uh, we've got nonfiction research and then anthologies are back over that way. We yeah. have some various Star Wars paraphernalia. And, and then you if have, you go, I mean, it, it's itemized. It's is it alphabetical order? Oh, it, it it there's a whole system. I can only imagine. So um, like, there's a whole section over here for uh, badass Jew stuff. Hey, let's talk about it. I well, you know, I write about a hitman who hides out as a rabbi, so I gotta have badass Jew shit, easy to grab because wow. it's, why why I, I I seem smart, I don't have the Talmud memorized. So I got the badass Jew shit real close. Yeah. And then I have books on counterinsurgency beneath them in case they right come for us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and this is the part where I always warn people, um, you not only have one Jew, you have two Jews now on the podcast. So well, don't say it out loud, man. People <laughs> will come. Uh, so wait, so you're pointing for the people who can't see, you're pointing behind your shoulder to some of your published books. Um, I want to talk about two of them specifically because you're kind of new to my world only because I'm new to the Twitter world. And I came across you via Scott O'Connor. He was on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw you kind of guys had back and forth or so whatever. I went into you and you seemed like, you know, a super dope guy. Um, and then I went a little farther in before we did the podcast and realized you were writing about mafia related stuff mm -hmm. with the tinge of Judaism to it. And I'm like, I have to fucking, we can talk for 13 <laughs> hours. Um, a couple of things. One, well, why, why mafia? Did you, was that a thing growing up for you? Were you around it? Where are you from? Uh, so I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, oh, and then, SF podcast. Right. So I, I grew up in Walnut Creek, um, you know, the hard, the hard streets of the Dub C, you know, you, you start rolling down Ignatia Valley, man. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who you're going to run into. Standing in front of the old Nordstrom's, they got crazy out there. So I lived, <laughs> lived in Walnut Creek. And then I lived uh, where I live now, which is uh, Palm Springs. Okay. Um, but my mom, um, she, she sort of liked to date dudes who were like, they said that they owned restaurants, but the restaurants never made any money. Or they owned suit stores, but no one ever bought any suits there. And they always had names like Bobby M. And you're like, well, what? how come Bobby doesn't have a last name? Like, well... His name isn't really Bobby either. <laughs> and this is in Walnut Creek. Well, this she dated some some mid-level dudes in the Bay Area. <laughs> and then when we moved to Palm Springs, Got it, yeah. Palm Springs is an open city and mm -hmm. it's always been an open city. And so the Chicago families, the New York families, the LA families, they all um, vacation basically in, in the desert. And, the, you know, like I went to school with like, the Zangaris and the Bananos and all these dudes who were the children or the nieces and nephews of all of these, um, you know, like capos. In, in these Bananos being things. one of the five families right. from New York. 
Right. And all these guys owned restaurants or hotels or had um, interests in these places. And so it was always a big part of Palm Springs when I lived here. And I'd been coming to Palm Springs even before we moved here. I moved here in um, my first year of high school. Um, but my family had been coming to Palm Springs since the 1950s. Oh, wow. Because it was the only place where Jews could play golf. Mm -hmm. and does, does Sinatra have a little bit of history down there too? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Big history, big history. And my mom and the Sinatras were friends. So my mom um, was the society columnist for the newspaper out here. So she was sort of, she was a gossip columnist. Oh, wow. So she knew all these people and hung out with all of them. And, and that was her life. So it was always sort of like floating around the ether when I was a kid. Um, but on top of that, like, you know, I, I grew up reading crime fiction. Um, you know, crime fiction was my young adult fiction. You know, I read the, you know, Elmer Leonard and John McDonald and uh, Dashiell Hammett and all that shit growing up. And so like, I wasn't reading John Green because I'm, I'm 50 years old. So John Green wasn't alive yet. Um, I was reading, I was reading, you know, the noir classics. That was my oh, shit yeah. I read, you know, in seventh grade. Yeah. So that, I think that part of it was sort of a natural thing, but I've always been fascinated by um, the banality of evil um, and, and also the glorification of a certain kind of organized crime and how, you know, people want to be a gangster. They don't, they don't want to be a, a, a vice lord or a gangster disciple. They want to be Sonny Corleone. And I want to know why they want to be that. Like why, all, all it is is a, a, a sociopath in a nice suit. Um, but you know, gangster fiction and gang life, gangster life is part and parcel to the American dream. It's the idea that I want to do whatever I want to do and I want to get away with it. And you can't tell me anything on my own man. And that's always appealed to me. So when I wrote Gangsterland, which came out in um, 2014, I had been writing sort of around gangsters for a long time. I just finished uh, a period of time where I was writing Burn Notice. And, um, you know, there's a, always been, there's a big organized crime element to Burn Notice. Um, and I just knew that I wanted to write about this character that I had written a short story of that had been in an anthology and um, had been optioned for a TV show and stuff. Um, and so I took a couple years off actually to become a better Jew to write <laughs> about this guy becoming a rabbi. Like I had to read all the books if yeah. I wanted to write about a fake rabbi. I mean, did I had you, grow, to know did you grow up religious at all? No, no. I yeah, mean, we're, yeah, yeah. we're, we're corned beef and mayonnaise Jews. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I call it or Larry David Jews. Yeah, yeah Larry, exactly. Well, Larry David, but he, <laughs> he might be more Jewish. <laughs> well, I mean, not to cut you off here and we'll continue where you are, but I mean, you know, we're running on a similar theme because I grew up where they filmed The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my father almost bought a restaurant and at the final meeting in Bergen County, New Jersey, 20 minutes west of Manhattan, in the final meeting, two guys that were never there before entered the room and it was told to him that, you know, not only do you have to pay you also have to pay, you know, Bobby and whatever. So in my life growing up, it was definitely, a, I'm a little younger. Um, I'm 33, you know, so Paul Castellano was killed the year before I was born. Right. Um, but, you know, but I became obsessed with th really through The Sopranos. And then through that, you know, read all the books, five families, everything. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Continue with what you're saying. But well, I, I mean, it, it's the thing like, you know, once you sort of see this stuff in real life, yeah. um, you get interested in it. You know, all these people that were my mom's friends and that were sort of circling around us. You know, there was this one guy named Paul whose restaurant burned down every three years. <laughs> and it would be weird because it's not like he was in a place where there was like, oh, exposed wires because you get a new restaurant every three years. <laughs> And every three years, it would burn down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was then, a pizza. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even even silly stuff. Like, I worked at um, at a hotel in Palm Springs when I was a kid. I worked at the Riviera as a pool boy. But I worked for this guy called um, called the Tan Man. <laughs> and the Tan Man ran this grift at the pool where he sold people suntan lotion and mink oil but really what we did is we'd sell it to these people and then we'd steal the bottles back and fill them with baby oil and sell them back to these people over and over and over again. And one day I went, I went to work and Tan Man was gone. And I was like, Tan Man owes me $167. Like I want my money. 
And so I'm walking around the hotel, the Riviera, which is this very old hotel yeah. in Palm Springs. Well, actually, it was a very old hotel. It's now uh, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville, but that's <laughs> another story. Um, and so I keep saying like, hey, where's Tanman? Where's Tanman? He owes me $167. No, he doesn't. <laughs> and they're like, man, we don't know what you're talking about. We've never even seen you. Yeah. Like, go talk to that guy. Go talk to yeah. that guy. And so I get run around. I end up in this dude's office, who's the general manager. And he's sitting behind a big ass desk and his you know, shirt's unbuttoned halfway down his chest. He's got rings on fingers. I didn't know he could wear rings on. And I'm like, hey, man, um, I work for Tan Man at the pool. And he owes me $167. I just want my money. And the guy's like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. And I was like, I'm Todd. I work for Tan Man. <laughs> I want my money. And he's like, you got a W9 here? And I was like, uh, no. Yeah. He's like, get the fuck out of my office. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. shit. Like, like, as soon as he said that, I realized I've, I've misjudged the situation in a yeah. profound yeah. way. And I went home and I said to my mom, mom the general manager of the Riviera wouldn't give me my money and told me to get the fuck off the property. And she's like, you asked the GM of the Riviera for money? Yeah, no. <laughs> like, he's a capo in a crime yeah. family. And I was like, oh. So all that fe fed into it, you know, yeah, all of sure. it. I mean, yeah. so like, I mean, were you a fan growing up, like the Godfathers and things like that? I mean, was it just yeah. you were fed into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well... Not to kind of piggyback off of what you're talking about to turn it on to me, but one of, you know, I, for, my first book was, uh, I wrote last year, got published. It was a boxing novella I had a, in Jersey City, and I had a mafia character, uh, Mario Skinny Legs Ritazzi. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, you know, so I've written about it, but I'm, one of the things I'm writing now, one of the novels, is a Jewish mafia novel based in Los Angeles in like the early 90s. And I'm trying to, but here's the thing. I, well, now that we're talking about, it, I can just ask you, you know, with now it's so much liter, you know, obviously The Godfather was a novel before it was a book, right. uh, you know, uh, with so much having been worked on in the genre, turning it into a Jewish kind of thing is new. And you're one of the only authors that I, I have found who's even done it. So now that I'm also writing about, I mean, you know, what elements were you trying to combine? I mean, you put it in Chicago, you know, I mean, are you trying to make it super Jewy? I mean, how do you do it? How do you play that balance? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard. Um, well, the first thing is um, you publish that book and I will sue you. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. You got like, I've worked hard for this niche. You come for my niche. <laughs> Don't worry, the first, the, the, the book that I'm trying to get published in the next couple of months has to do with a fictional rock and roll band. That okay, is fine. Priority Perfect. number one. Do not worry Perfect. about that. Yeah, I will not write about a fictional rock and roll band. <laughs> um, you know, the, it, it's a tough balance. So, you know, the character that I write about, um, Rabbi David Cohen, he's not Jewish. You know, he is a Chicago hitman named Sal Cupertine who hides as a Jewish, as a rabbi in Las Vegas. Um, but by the act of hiding as a rabbi in order to do the job effectively, he becomes a Jew, basically. He has to. Um, and so for me, you know, the, the Judaism and, you know, the Talmudic studies and the Midrash and all the stuff that comes into play is not about the faith. It's about the evolution of, uh, of reason in this guy um, and the evolution of empathy in him that once he has shown um, a, a different way to live, that it changes the way he approaches his life. It doesn't make him any less of a stone cold killer, mm -hmm. um, but it gives him different feelings about stuff. You know, the, the, the thing though, that um, has always been interesting to me is, you know, I, I've gone around and, and spoken at, you know, tons and tons of synagogues over the years, because my book ends up getting picked by, you know, all of these Jewish book clubs. How, how's that crowd? I, I can see that old. being fun. Old. <laughs> old. Okay, okay. <laughs> old. Well, yes, but also hopefully humorous. Old. <laughs> okay, fair enough. We'll leave it at that. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, they're 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 quite funny. Yeah. Um, until you say the thing that I always ask, which is, would I be here if my last name were Sullivan? Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, so you 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 walk a very thin line, even um, as a Jew with anti-Semitism. You know, yeah. um, you know, pe people don't um, people don't the, the non-Jews don't want too much of it, 
and the ardent Jews want to tell you that you're wrong. Um, and so you have to, I think, um, figure out sort of where you are in, in that world. I'm writing about a rabbi. I got to get a lot of shit right. Yeah. But the whole conceit that I'm doing is that no one knows anything. And so my rabbi character will quote Bruce Springsteen and say, well, you know, as the Talmud says, is a dream a lie if it don't come true or is it something worse? And the people will be like, oh my God, Rabbi, thank you. That that does help things. Um, because if you quote I knew Bruce I was Springsteen, born to run, yeah. Yeah, like if, if you if you quote Bruce Springsteen um, and you say it in the right tone, it sounds like the Talmud. You know, I'm a it's Jersey like, boy, trust me, I'm well aware. I, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, two faces have I. Like, oh, thank you, Rabbi. It's like that, that's actually a song from Tunnel of Love. Um, so it, it, it's a hard balance because no one wants to read a crime novel to learn about religion and they don't want to read a religious book to learn about crime. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, there'll, there'll be some dark nights. Of the soul oh, no, I, mean, I, I wasn't wrong. like, I wasn't sitting here trying to literally pick your brain. It was just, I mean, the coincidence was too uncanny, you know, I'm, but I'm the kind, and this is what I'll ask you next. I'm the kind of writer that I'm working on seven different things at once. Right. You do the same thing. No. So are you one project at a time? Uh, one sort of narrative project. I can write um, a book and a screenplay at the same time, or I can write um, a book and criticism at the same time, but I can't write two books at the same time, or I can't write a book and a short story at the same time. Uh -huh. um, because I keep so much of it in my head. I don't, I'm not an outliner, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the stuff that I write is, is so much pinging around in my head that there's other things in there. Um, I, I find it less effective. And that also ends up being a problem. Like, you know, when I'm working on a book and need to go to the grocery store and I'm like, I don't know why I'm here. Or Target. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know why I'm here, but I do know that if someone pisses me off, I want to kill them. Well, are you the kind of, do, I mean, are you writing on your phone, doing voice memos and notes and stuff like that? Um, I, will, I will call myself and say uh, things like, you know, remember, you know, bury body in desert in chapter seven. Or I'll be in the shower and I'll scream to my wife, Wendy, come here. She'll come in. I'll be like, go to my desk, write on a post-it note. Bullet enters his neck, but at an angle. Yeah. And Wendy will be like, what the fuck are you talking yeah. about? Don't worry. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, we've talked to so many <laughs> authors now that it's kind of the running theme where it's just, you know, you have to be open to all those kinds of things where it's just, if a dude walks into a Starbucks wearing, you know, stiletto pumps, you know, you have to be open to the idea of like, I can use that to change a character in chapter three. Right. That, you know, it's been fucking with me the entire time. So it sounds like you're the kind of author who's, you're open to that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, particularly like for my new book, um, which is a story collection, um, you know, I, I, I had an arc that I knew that I wanted to write about. So there's 12 stories in the low desert. And I knew that there were different kinds of stories I wanted to write um, for different sort of parts of the overall narrative that I had in my mind. And so I'd be working on one story and an idea for something that I, a story that I had not even thought about yet, but that I sort of had an idea of what the emotion would be would pop, pop in my head and I'd be like, ah, oh, shit. shit and I'd yeah. write on a little piece of paper, like for other story, put in murder clown. It'd be like, I don't know what I'm using murder clown for, but I, I know that I want one. Uh -huh. And I, I think that's, you know, as writers, as you know, like, you know, when the muse shows up, you're not gonna be like, ah, oh, bro, I'm watching football. Like <laughs> you have to, you have to, service the muse when he shows up yeah, i mean are you a fairly are you fairly disciplined in that approach though where i mean are you right every day same time kind of thing or how, how does your life operate with the routine uh, you know you know like i i take i take big breaks from from writing at some points too so in addition to writing books i also um direct and founded one of the largest creative writing programs in the country okay and cool. so <laughs> i <laughs> I periodically need to do my job that, at, at UC Riverside. Um, and so there are days when I don't do any writing whatsoever. When I'm working on a book and when I'm finishing a book, I'm, I'm usually working five days a week. Yeah. But like right now, you know, uh, my new book comes out in February. I'm not really working on anything except for some rewrites on some stuff. And I'm doing that sort of as I want to. But, you know, I'm 15 books into a career so i know sort of what i need to do for um 
for my rest, basically, like to recharge myself creatively. There, there was a period where I wrote three books in, uh, in very short order. I wrote Gangsterland, uh, which came out in 2014. And I wrote a book called The House of Secrets that I, I wrote with uh, my friend Brad Meltzer. And then I wrote Gangster Nation, which came out in 2018. And those three books ended up being 450 pages each. And when I was done with Gangster Nation, like I did not want to write anything. Most definitely, yeah. You know, I was just so tired. I mean, tired emotionally, but also tired physically. Like it's just like a lot of sitting on my ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, so, and, and, and mental gymnastics. Yes. Too. And so I really needed to recharge my batteries, and and so that means like not writing every single day, going out and experiencing the world and, and living and listening to people. And that's why I ended up writing a story collection after that, because I, I really felt like, oh, I want to, I want to get back to work. Um, but I also don't want to write the same. I, I have a third gangster novel that I have to write, but I just don't want to go back into that world yet. I was just, I was yeah. just really tired. Um, and so writing the stories was a great way for me to, um, to write another book, um, but not, not exercise the same muscle to the point of exhaustion again. So if we could, if we can, I, I want to rewind the tape back a little bit. Sure. Um, you, uh, you said you said you had you have fifteen novels out. Uh, thirteen books of fiction, two books of nonfiction. You worked on. You said screenplays as well, mm -hmm. and everything. Where did it begin? You know, wh when did you get to writing? What did you first start writing? Were you writing short stories in the beginning? Were you writing poetry about heartbreak? You know, what did, what got you into it all? I was mostly writing Echo and the Bunnyman lyrics and giving okay, them to girls. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Talk, you're talking to a fish fan, so don't worry. <laughs> um, well, I come from a family of writers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the important thing is that I didn't learn to write until I was, I was quite old because I'm, I'm profoundly dyslexic. So I didn't learn to actually write until I was, or read and write until I was about 10. Um, but, you know, my, my family are all writers. My mom uh, was a journalist. My dad was a broadcast journalist in the Bay Area um, and also in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. My brother has uh, published 70 novels and oh, produced eight well, What's million. your brother's name? Lee. Lee Goldberg. Yeah. Great. Um, we're a crime family. Um, my sisters, you know, have written a bunch of books together and then one's an artist and the other is a lawyer. And, you know, so writing is the family business. My uncle has published, you know, uh, 15 books or something. Yeah. So it was never something that seemed unattainable. You know, I, I think, and this is probably true for you, I would guess, like if you, when you told your family, oh, I want to be a writer that you could have said, oh, I, I want to, I want to be an NFL quarterback. I did worse. I told them I wanted to be a rock and roll musician. And I, and I moved into a van at the age of 22 and toured the country for 10 years. Well, that's not so bad. <laughs> I start, I started writing it uh, three years ago. I got into, but I'm, I've been reading. I mean, my father, you know, the man would read, would rather read than talk to me. So, you know, that was, that was growing up. That's what it was. So I always read, but it was something I never thought I could actually do until a couple of years ago. Well, you know, it's so funny. Like, when I hear music, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big music fan and um, I don't understand how it's made. I don't understand orchestration at all. I understand how to write lyrics, right? Um, but I don't understand when they say, all right, watch me for the changes. Like, I don't know what's happening, um, but I find myself so inspired by it. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of it and I listen to it constantly. I was listening to music right before we got on. Um, but it's such an unknowable art to me. So if I had said to my own family, hey, I want to write books, they, they were like, oh, that's fine. You should go do that. If I had said, I want to write books, but also I want to, I want to learn how to play guitar, they would have been like, well, we don't play guitar. We are, <laughs> we are Jews with very thick fingers. We're, there's there's going to be no guitar playing in this family. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, so I started out, um, you know, with, with a deck full of cards that had already been turned over for me to yeah, play with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I started out writing short stories and, um, you know, after college, I graduated college in 1994, I worked in advertising for a couple of years. Um, and I was writing short stories and getting those sort of steadily published. And then after I had published probably, I don't know, two or three dozen stories over, you know, between for like, in like three or four years, I was, what kind of publications? Oh, you know, literary magazines that also sound like Airbnbs, you of know, course, like yeah, the, yeah. the Blue Mountain Biscuit Review, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the sun yeah. um the, the honey drizzle gazette or something like yeah that. like if if it sounds like a craft beer or yeah. a, a or like a bed and breakfast somewhere and you, you put review on the end of it yeah. that too is publishing me um but so after i'd done that for a few years I, I i tried my hand at writing a novel and uh i got extraordinarily lucky and i sold that first novel i was 28 oh, wow. years old okay um and then um shortly after selling the novel uh miramax um optioned the book to make a movie with Cameron Diaz. Okay, hold on, pause real quick. I don't mean to cut you <laughs> off, so hold on. So so not everyone has that story, right? Mo- no. mo- mo- the majority of the people we talk to, um, you know, it's the MFA program, the Iowa Writer Workshop. They get thrown into a room with 10 agents. One of them's going to buy the book, and then a year later it happens. Um, it doesn't happen this way for everyone. Can you kind of just real quick, can you talk about that moment in time? Like when that first book sold, I mean, can you kind of yeah. break that down? You know, and it the the experience that MFA students have is not actually that different than the experience that I had at that time. The difference is that I didn't go get my MFA at the time, um, but I was taking classes at UCLA Extension Writers Program, which is an online writing program that uh, UCLA does through their extension. Um, and I took classes there for two or three years with really good writers. Um, and so it was sort of a de facto MFA for me in those years. And that's where I was writing the short stories. Yeah. And I fell under the tutelage of a writer named Tom Filer, um, who had had a crazy career. Like he wrote The Monster with a Million Eyes and had been a B-movie actor and then had gone on to write very literary short stories. And, and you know, he won all the right prizes, the, you know, the Pushcart and Yo Henry and the Best American and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then he had published a novel and it gotten a bad review in the New York Times. This was in like, you know, this is 40 years before either of us were born. Um, it gotten a bad review in the New York Times and that was it. Yeah. It crushed him. Yeah. And he's like, I don't ever want to feel the way I felt after that review. So I'm not going to write novels anymore. And so he just became, he dedicated himself to being a teacher and writing short stories. And he was my mentor. Um, and he lived on, he lived in the guest house on Peter Graves' property, the actor Peter Graves. And so he'd go to his house for class and be parked in the wrong place. Peter Graves would come out in his fucking boxer shorts and be like, move your fucking car. Love it. Love it. <laughs> like, oh, Love sorry, it. Mission Impossible. And this is all in Los Angeles? Yeah, this is all yeah, in LA. I mean, only in LA. I mean, it's just, it's what a, what a crazy town. Yeah. <laughs> but this, this group that I was with was filled with fantastic writers and they really, they really pushed me. And so by the time I started writing my novel, it was, it was essentially like an MFA experience because I'd, I'd been workshops for several years at that point. Um, but you know, the process of finding an agent and selling the book were just as fraught as anyone else. You know, I, I'm still waiting to hear back from a couple of the agents that I queried and 1997 or whatever it was i'm sure i'm sure they're going to get back to me real soon yeah um but i sold my first book um you know it had been rejected by like 36 publishers in like three weeks (laughs) and i i began to understand how my former mentor felt (laughs) um and then uh it ended up getting published by uh simon schuster um, they had a line of books that MTV published called MTV Books, and they published the book. And, you know, it was sort of a, a little crime novel called uh, Fake Liar Cheat. Um, it came out, it got terrible reviews because it was not a very good book. Um, but Miramax had optioned it, like I had said, to for a movie for Cameron Diaz. Who, um, I mean, at that time was the... She, she was it. Like, yeah, she, she was There's it. something about Mary, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, so what happened was after something about Mary, they had bought the book for her after something about Mary or right around then. um, It was was about the same time. And she decided, oh, no, I I don't want to make noir movies. I want to go win an Academy Award. And that was that. Like, like as soon as she said no, it was dead. Yeah. yeah. Um, But that was fine because they had already paid me. Um, But that I mean, that's how it works when you have your book options. Sometimes, I mean, almost all the time. When I sell my books, I get paid a bunch of money and then nothing happens and that's fine. Um, but it set me on the path that I've, I've stayed on for the next 20 years. I mean, that book came out in 2000 and I've put out a book every 18 months basically since that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that first book comes out, uh, it's 2000. Now we're 
20 well, now we're in 2021 right mm-hmm. what have you seen change in this profession in the last oh gosh year? yeah i mean you know Every- again we started this podcast off by saying i came across you via twitter right twitter wasn't even a th- obviously a thing 20 years ago um just that alone has changed everyone's lives obviously without getting too specific about it but you know half the authors i read i find via instagram now and right. if you go on instagram half these authors have personalities and it's a whole fucking shtick and whatever what have you what are the, the big biggest changes you've seen in the last 20 years do you know writing these books oh gosh it's hard to say i mean it you know the world has changed so many different times. I mean, the world changed after 9-11. You know, the world changed after Obama was elected. The world's going to change in about six days um, when Trump's out of office. You know, the the world changed four days ago when the Capitol was attacked. The world changed because there was a pandemic. You know, all these things are happening. The one thing that um, that I've seen that I think is the, the, the biggest sort of tactical change does have to do with... Um, with social media, you know, it used to be that you'd read a book and you wouldn't know, like the author could be alive or they could have been dead for a hundred years. And All you, you knew was know. that one little fucking photo right. in the back and that was it. That was it. And you'd be like, oh, this guy worked as a shrimp boat captain and in a bowling alley as a degree from NYU. You're like, okay, whatever. And yeah, like, he that has was, a dog named Sherla. Yeah, and that was it. Like you didn't know anything. Now, any person can go online and they can see me having a conversation with my friends on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, that used to be the stuff where you'd have to read the letters after I was dead to find out what we were talking about. Like, if you want to know what's going on in the literary world, you read sort of book Twitter and you see everyone having conversations with each other about whatever's pissing each other off. There, you know, so that's sort of a fascinating thing. Like, you know, if I, I can't talk shit about people online anymore because they, (laughs) They find out. That's hard. It's just, um, it's so, yeah, yeah. So you know, social media has changed that for the good and for the bad. Now, for me, it's it's an easy thing. You know, I'm an I'm an extrovert, um, and so being out there and, and meeting the fans and talking to them and having conversations, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but you know, plenty of authors don't want to engage with anybody. Um, sure. They're writers, the writers, because we're you know we're little mole people. You know, you, you choose to be a writer not because you want to be on stage. You choose to be a writer because you want to hide behind your book. Um, so there's there's a little that that's a big thing. You know, ebooks of course didn't exist when I first started out. Um, so that's a, a big difference. Not that I ever read ebooks. You, um, you, yeah, I mean, you have a book show. I mean, we, do you know who you know who Bob Leftsets is? Yeah. He was just on the podcast, and I brought this, and I fuck. I mean, you bring up anything to that dude, it's gonna spark a fire in him. But we we started talking about. He's like, I haven't read a fucking book since you know two thousands. I've been reading Kindles this since the day it came out. He's like, and then he got into it, and it's worth people who were listening to this podcast going to that podcast and listening to what he has to talk about, just the publishing business, and you know, and how they, you know, again, he comes from the music world, so do I, and we can compare the music world losing their business model when Napster came out, right? Right. I mean, that talk about changing the entire business model. I'm not, you know, I'm a little younger. So when the Kindle came out in my generation, you know, to me, it was, it was just a way to like read more books. Right. But I don't know where it sits in the public conscious right now. I don't, people seem to have, it's a love hate thing. Is it more of a, yeah, I, you it, know, I, it, you hate Amazon or not you, no. but is that what, the, is that what the convo is? I don't know. No, no. I, I like Amazon plenty. They, they not own you, the, but people, they own, they own the television rights to Gangsterland. I'm very happy with <laughs> Very happy with Amazon. Um, <laughs> this, this podcast is brought to you by Amazon. You, uh, in fact, the most recent episode of Literary Disco, my the podcast that I host with. Oh, you have a friends. podcast. Yeah, that okay, the last cool. one was in fact brought to them by Amazon. If I remember, Fantastic. if I heard the advertising correctly. What was um, the name of it? Literary Disco is awesome. the show cool. that I host. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, the, uh, essentially, eBooks have replaced the mass market paperback. You know, the, the, the $4 paperback you'd buy to go on a cruise, right? Yeah. Like Airplane that's, reading is my father. Would yeah, call. exactly. And I think that's great. You know, the, the one thing that I think people thought it was going to do that it hasn't done is provide the uh, democratization of independent writing like it does independent music. You know, something like Bandcamp, um, you know, yeah. where I buy a lot of independent artists, 
um, or even Spotify where, you know, I'm on constantly where, you know, you can listen to any independent artist and it, you know, it sounds just the same and you have just as much access to them as you do, you know, the Rolling Stones. Of course. People thought that ebooks are going to do that for independent writers, self-published writers, essentially, but it doesn't. And, and the reason is that people are often self-published for a reason. And it's that they're not good enough to be paid <laughs> and they don't have the people editing their work. And therefore, when the work gets to the marketplace, it's not as good as other stuff. So I can go listen to, you know, an independent rapper that I like. And he's just as good and has just as good a beats as Dre. Um, the difference is that he's making his own money and Dre is a billionaire. Yeah. Um, but there's not that, there's not that in there's not that indie writer uh of of books like there is the indie musician or it or indie film. It just doesn't exist at that same level. Um, and I think people thought Kindle was gonna do that, but it hasn't succeeded in it. It has succeeded in filling Amazon with ebooks that aren't any good but it hasn't made that person explode, you know? Well, I think we're talking like gatekeepers, right? You right. Know, and with the music business, the gatekeeper has always been the record label, the A&R person. Right. And with music, you know, again, I, I, I people are fucking so annoyed. That's all I talk about, but that's the world I'm from. And in the, you know, you make an album or this guy, whoever puts an album on SoundCloud or whatever, that album shelf life is infinite. You can listen right. to songs 30 years from later. It's still with books. It's, you got a one shot deal. You know, how many books have you reread? You know what I'm saying? A lot, like, but you know, I'm a I, professor. Okay. So okay. I'm but a you know, professor. I, <laughs> I have some books I'm going to probably thumb back through for references. But you I know, mean, I have know. stacks of books just right here because <laughs> I'm a professor, you know, so I just, <laughs> there it is uh but with the you know with music again yeah you independent artists can put it out there and you can build a following but you're right it's interesting you say that about the kindle how it originally was thought about that's how it was going to bring about a new market and it hasn't is that a good thing or a bad thing oh i i mean i think if you want to self-publish putting your book on kindle is the is the best way to do it don't pay someone don't don't you know don't give someone ten thousand dollars to design crappy cover art for you you know like just put it up on the Kindle. I, you know, I, I, um, because a lot of first time authors are listening to this, you know? And yeah, it's like, you know, it, it's hard to say, you know, as the, I'll, I'll tell you what I would tell my students. So, as the yeah. director of the MFA in creative writing and writing for the performing arts at the University of California, Riverside, what I tell my students is if you want to self publish, you have got to also be the world's greatest marketer. And in addition to being the world's greatest marketer, you also have to be the world's greatest copy editor. In addition to being the world's greatest copy editor, you also have to be the world's greatest editor. And in addition to being the world's great, so I give them the list of all the things they gotta be if they wanna do it that way. Reddit gave me that list. The professor didn't give me that. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I, I just take it from Reddit and hand it to them, but the, because I say it in that voice, it means more. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. Well, we talked to well, we talked to Scott, and he, you know, he I think self published his first book. It was a novella, and like he said, you know, back then he was working a couple of different jobs. He was he's an LA guy too, and he was originally I think pursuing acting. Um, right. When he first moved there, um, and he put out that first book. But, you know, but that was a different time. You know. Yeah. So, yeah the self published thing is interesting. You know, I think what was that book, The Martian, right? Matt Damon movie wasn't that? That was a self published book, but you no, know, no, not, lottery. So I it, was, it wasn't quite self-published so andy oh. andy and i are friends um oh, great cool and andy published it online as a blog essentially. oh okay um and then it became uh the the blog became extraordinarily popular and then the, he finished writing the book when it was bought by simon schuster or whomever and he's got a new book coming out in a couple months actually um, which you should all buy. I'm a big Andy Weir fan. He's a good yeah, yeah, no, most definitely. Um, and wasn't the same kind of thing with the Fifty Shades of Grey? Didn't that start out as um, f fan fiction off the Twilight series? And I think oh, she right, have, right. Yeah, yeah, she might have published that. But again, you know, that's like winning the fucking law. Yeah, but you know, the reason you know about these things is because they're remarkable. Exactly. Yeah, no. You and know? good art's gonna, you know, truly good art, I think, if you can, if the person is intelligent about how they put it out to the world it can find the audience it needs to find. 
Um, right. And there's an audience for everything. I mean, you know, we bring up the word Stephen King a lot. People either roll their eyes or they agree, but the guy sold 800 billion fucking books. Yeah. Steve, Stephen King changed my life when I was a kid. Did you, you, did you read on writing? Uh, I did read on writing. Yeah, um, yeah. But the thing that Stephen King did for me when I was a kid reading his books, in addition to scaring the, the crap out of me, is he made me understand that I wasn't the only person on the planet who thought the way that I think. You know, like, oh, someone else looks at the world and sees this skewed thing or sees a clown and imagines them being horrible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, and, and in a way, that's what books are really supposed to do for, for kids. You know, you remember those books that mattered to you when you're young because you'd never experienced anything like them before and you never quite experienced that again. Um, and so Stephen King, when I was, you know, 12, 13 years old and reading his books, um, he he showed me that what I wanted to write about was possible in a way. But more than that, that the dark, weird, funny things or the things that I found funny and weird that I was interested in were not all that unusual. They didn't make me strange. Uh, they made me an artist, you know? And he, he's great. I, I lost an award to Stephen King. Um, and- he, he, Do you think he the, remembers it? Probably not. <laughs> Um, when I was nominated, like they called me and they're like, Hey, you're, you know, you're a finalist for this award. It's the Hammett prize, which is this great big award for, for crime fiction. And I was thrilled to death. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm a finalist for the Hammett prize. This is great. I can't believe yeah. it. And I called, uh, I called Brad Meltzer, my friend. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm a finalist for the Hammett prize. I can't believe it. He's <laughs> like, well, who else are the finalists? And I was like, Oh, let me find out. I gotta get in line. So I'm like, okay, it's me. I was like, it's, oh God, it's James Lee Burke. And he's like, oof, oof, okay. Who else? And I was like, um, oh God, it's Stephen King. He's like, oh, he's like, well, when you get there, if Stephen King is there, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I could, I mean, that would be like, you know, going up against like Christian Bale or something like that. I mean, yeah, and I was like, shouldn't Stephen King pull himself out of contention? That's you know, crazy. like, oh, go ahead, Goldberg. Uh, that, dude, of... that dude is i mean i hope they if they may ever make a movie about him and I, I hope they do it right that dude had a fucking crazy life yes um, he, did. I mean, he i mean you know he really was the rock and roll writer that people mm -hmm. try to you know really write about sorry that's my bulldog puppy um and yeah and wait, everyone she's a favorite on the podcast it's reba Oh, hi. Yeah, she's a f eight month old bulldog puppy barking outside my window um <laughs> i gave her a bone but she'll leave it well, um, if my dog Rube Goldberg comes in, I, I will show her too. Okay, please do. Yeah, but I mean, that too, I mean, yeah, for people who don't know, I mean, you know, he was drinking, what, 30 cases of beer a night? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he was necessarily a rock and roll uh, writer. I think he was just a drug addict. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, but people have this idea, you know, they can fictionalize or try to, you know, create this character, but he was kind of a living character, I guess, in his time. Uh, yeah, you know, that's blast, for sure. Blast and Slayer, because he's open about his drug addiction and shit like that. Yeah, I mean, he was a big coke addict and alcoholic. I mean, he wrote some, he doesn't even remember writing some All of the books. All that book. shit. And, and the and story then you, of his. You read the book and you're like, oh, yeah, I know why he doesn't remember writing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, again, but he's, I mean, how many books has he written at this point? Oh. Any idea? 60. I don't know, I don't know yeah, a lot. That's crazy. A lot. I mean, he's been publishing books my entire life. 77, I think, Carrie came oh. out. No, I, I think Carrie, I want to say something. One of his books came out in like 74. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Thanks. again, he talks about in on writing all the rejections he, he was teaching at the time when he was submitting that first book. Um, yeah. So I mean, rejection's the thing that, that hardens you for this life. Like if you can't take rejection for, for those aspiring writers out there, if you can't take rejection, like I still, like when I think about those 36 rejections for the first book I wrote, like it actually gives me, PTSD. I'm like, oh God. We have, yeah, we have a running chart on the podcast. Janet Fitch is leading it. I have, I have, I got rejected 73 times, but I Ooh. did it, but I did it the wrong way. And Todd, maybe, you know, you could shed light on this, the submission, the querying process. But I was just like, I wrote this little no, no, 27,000 word novella. I'm like, let me just query every single agent on the internet. Right. I did. <laughs> and, and 73 of them were like, we like it, but. And then I learned the hard truth of rejection. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, at this point, I don't know if you're even dealing with rejection anymore in your work, but I mean, you like you said, you you have to get you're gonna get yeah. rejected. 
Yeah. And Janet, I mean, Janet's story is crazy. Janet was oh, rejected. Yeah. Do, do you know Janet? Like, okay, yeah. Yeah, Janet and I are friends. Oh, great, dope, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, she, if she was on your show, you know, like, she was rejected like, like 160 times. She said she, could, she, she did a wallpaper of her entire yeah. wall. Um, she's fucking off. She, we, I, I, I fucked up on that podcast because I didn't have enough time. You only did 30 minutes. So I mean, I could talk to her for three hours. She's great. Um, yeah, she's she's a, she's a, she's a cool cat. Um, so what, what's going on for you right now? I mean, what are you working on? I mean, are, are you always working on something? I know you're teaching, but what does the future kind of have for you? Well, my new book comes out, as I said, uh, yeah. February 2nd. So I don't know when this is airing, but would you uh, it's either. Normally... How would you, in a normal world, how would you normally be promoting it? Do you ever do readings? Do you do book tours and things like that? Yeah, I would, I would be on the road probably yeah. for, um, you know, two months. Oh, what a bummer. Fuck. Yeah, yeah I, it, it is. It's upsetting um, because I like I like waking up in a courtyard in a small Midwestern town. Well, I did it for a decade. <laughs> like, you only know yourself by where the pancakes are. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I mean, so that's a little upsetting that I don't get to go on tour, but I don't want to die, so yeah, yeah. that's okay. Um, so normally, yeah, I'd be on the road for two months, but, you know, I'm going to do as many events as I possibly can online. You know, the, we'll have a full schedule out on my website sometime soon. The book launches, you know, on the 2nd, so the events start on the 3rd. Um, and so I'll be doing that for the next two months or so. Um, you know, as many events as I possibly can. And I'm working on a, uh, a screenplay right now um, and on the, um, the TV version of Gangsterland. Um, so those are things I've been working on a bit for the last couple months with uh, with secret people I can't tell you about. Um, well, is that it, real? I'm sorry to stop you there, and maybe if we could talk a little bit about that. The difference, do you, you know, the difference between writing long form fiction and screenplays. I mean, you have a, I mean, not necessarily a preference, but do you approach them differently? Is it kind of equal footing for you at this point? No, you know, I hadn't written a screenplay in a very, very long time, actually, um, and so I dedicated this year to getting my chops up for it because yeah. I wanted to do some more TV stuff. Um, and so, you know, I basically have said like this year I'm, I'm, and when I say this year, I actually mean this school year. <laughs> so that that's how like time is a flat circle for me. And it's yeah. just always the school year. So a year for me is October to June, <laughs> um, is I'm working on screenplays. So I'll be doing that for, for a while this year, but it's a completely different, you know, it's a complete, completely different way of writing. In a completely different way of looking at a uh, story. But I knew that I, um, I had some uh, work I had to do on the uh, adaptation of Gangsterland um, that I'm involved with. And then I wanted to write um, a pilot of my own. Um, so I've been doing that. Um, and I'm gonna write something else uh, probably starting next week or so. And then after that, I have to write the next uh, concluding chapter of the Gangsterland saga. So. But the, well, the low desert is I, uh, connected, I, but is not finishing it. I feel like you're contradicting yourself, though, because in the beginning, you said you only work on one thing at a time. You just named like a dozen things. Well, I finished them. <laughs> oh, OK, got it. Got it. OK, OK. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I finish. I send it somewhere. And then I, so you, I so a lot watch of football. Hot, yeah, a lot of hot <laughs> irons are out there right now. Right. Yeah. Lots of stuff. And then, you know, and then um, the, the teaching and all that uh, happens on a on a regular basis too, you know, when you, when you found your own creative writing program at the University of California, it turns out that uh, you don't want to see it fail. Most and definitely. so uh, for the last 15 years that I've been in charge of the MFA program, you know, I spend a great deal of time on that because my students are fantastic and I care about them and I want them to succeed. Um, and so I spend a lot of time working with my students and working with my professors and um, getting all that sort of stuff set up too. So there's not a lot of downtime, um, but you know the the key I think to a, a successful and long career as a writer is when I sit down to write, I'm ready to write. You know, I don't I I don't concede that writer's block exists. Um, I when I, when I am sitting here, like you know, right. I have to, I, I have to trick it. myself. You know, I have to play the music. You know, I have to have the coffee, the cocaine. And then, <laughs> and then I can go. Um, but there's up. very rarely any times where I sit down to write where I'm like, I can't do it. This is not going to happen. I can't do it. Like, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would ask the question, but you have so much. You know, you have such a backlog that at this point, it's like you. 
you don't have to convince yourself that you can do it. You know that you can do it. It's just doing no, it. No, 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 no. Oh, really? That's why the, still, to this day. Yeah, that's why all those pictures are back there. So when I'm <laughs> sitting, you know, literally, I've got a big screen over here that I write on. True. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, I don't know how to get out of this scene. I've For never the people who can't before. see the the video for the, only the audio. Yeah, Todd is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I turn around and I look at all these. And I'm like, oh right. I've done this before. Yeah. I've done this before. Yeah. Todd, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, I, I always do two questions at the end. Uh, first question is, where are people buying your books from? I know you're a SoCal guy. What bookstores do you like to rep? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I like uh, I like Skylight Books in L.A. Um, I like uh, Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego. I like Mystery Inc. In That's Huntington a Beach. One. I like uh, East Bay Booksellers in Oakland. Definitely. Yeah. The, my, uh, the, the former Diesel Books. Um, you know, I've been buying a lot of books from bookshop.org um, where, you know, it, it all goes through an independent bookstore. So yeah, people can buy my books wherever they want to. Dope. And I know, again, we started this off by saying I found you via Twitter. Uh, you're pretty prolific on there. You're pretty active. Uh, you want people to follow you? What's your handle? It's it's pretty inventive. I don't know. I, I, drum, I don't know. Wait, dr wait, drum roll, please. It's at... Todd Goldberg. Love it. Todd, this has been a pleasure, man. I, I thought people would be confused by it at first. Like, is it too much? I think you hit it right on the <laughs> nailed it. Just it's a, anything more would have been superfluous. <laughs> and they can they can also uh, listen to um, my strangely and inordinately popular podcast, Literary Disco, which I host yes. with uh, Ryder Strong and Julia Pistel. In fact, this week we interviewed uh, George Saunders. Oh, most I, definitely. Yeah, of course. I geeked out a little bit when I was talking to George Saunders. I, yeah. I'm like, why am I geeking out? He's nearly a contemporary, <laughs> but I still geeked out. I, I barely held my shit together, man. Barely. Well, you did it. Thank you. Thank, but you. thank you for holding your shit together for this podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later, man. Thanks. Bye-bye.